Kang is a time-traveling supervillain who has finally decided that he will conquer Earth and prevent them from destroying themselves. Welcome to where reality meets fiction, where your stories are read back to you in a dramatic fashion, where I get to pretend to be a voice actor. This is Comic Storian, and we take the time to make you a comic book expert by filling you in on the big moments happening within the world of comics, or the moments that have already happened. We do cut out B-plots and limit our panel usage to prevent copyright problems, but also allow you to have something to read to yourself and collect if you choose so. I recommend going to your local comic book store and starting your own collection, or you can use one of our sponsors, Shortboxed. Click the link down below to learn how you can win a graded comic book yourself and discover the world of collectible comics. This storyline takes place in 2001, so the lineup of the Avengers is going to be a little different. It's also 16 to 17 issues, so it's going to be a multi-part series right here at Comic Storian. Today we're going to be bringing you parts 1 through 4, and if you want early access to the rest of them as we create them instead of waiting for the releases, check out our Patreon, patreon.com slash comic storian. Alright, let's get into the first part of Kang Dynasty. Aboard his massive ship orbiting the blue orb of Earth, Kang stares down at the planet. His son at his side as he explains the battle plan for finally conquering the world. He explains to his son, the Scarlet Centurion, what is most important about conquering a world is controlling the battlefield. If you are attacking, you must have easier access to the enemy than he has to you. In short, you must have the high ground, he declares with a smile. Finally turning away from his view of Earth, ordering his son to the transport chamber. Our moment is at hand, and if the Avengers should involve themselves, they will not withstand us. Meanwhile, over at the Avengers Mansion, Warbird, otherwise known as Carol Danvers, is testing her new abilities, trying to learn her limits after losing her access to the cosmic energy that gave her her powers recently. She fights against robots in the training exercise that Hank Pym has developed for her, finally absorbing enough energy to destroy them. Color me impressed, and that's probably still not your limit, Carol. Hank tells her over the comms, and she thanks him for the help and the heads up out of the chamber. When he's alone, Hank suddenly doubles over in pain. Not fair. The other one got this. Proved he was the fake. He gasps as he falls over to the ground. Meanwhile, over in Arizona, Wonder Man and Wanda Maximoff are riding horses through the desert, discussing Simon's recent return from the dead and trying to decide what comes next. He tells her that the charity foundation that he started has asked him to take a more active role, which would mean that he has to move to Los Angeles. Do you want to come with me? He asks her and Wanda is shocked, not sure if she should move across the country. I understand. You don't have to take the offer. Simon tells her, but Wanda shakes her head, telling him that he needs to do this, and they'll figure everything else out later. Meanwhile, over in Siberia, a team of Avengers have been called in to help a team of Russian scientists and superheroes who are investigating a radiation signature. They arrive at the coordinates, but find nothing. And the comms come to life, showing the scientists trying to call for help, with explosions ripping apart behind them before the screen goes black. Captain America rushes towards the combat vehicle's ramp, ordering the rest of the team to grab their radiation suits as they prepare for a fight. We've got to get down there, fast! He shouts to the team, and suddenly the alarms begin to blare inside of the Avengers mansion, alerting the rest of the team to a disturbance at the United Nations building. Over at the UN, there's a tunnel of light, and the Scarlet Centurion makes his appearance to the world. Hear me, people of this era! I am Scarlet Centurion, and I have come to you as an envoy, from one greater than you could ever dream of becoming. Make way and prepare to welcome him. The Scarlet Centurion cries, and the guards raise their weapons as the Centurion grows angry. Back off now, or you face the Avengers, Wasp shouts as the team arrives. Tony trying to reason with the villain, but the Centurion lashes out with his power staff, forcing everyone to leap out of the way. Iron Man and Warbird leaping at him, but Centurion grabs Tony by the face as he swats Warbird aside. That's when Goliath is there punching Centurion and knocking Tony clear. Vision rushes in, trying to phase through the villain's chest to stop him, but Centurion laughs as he explains that his energy field stops the Vision and shocks him away. You're good, Scarlet Centurion, but we've got your measure now, Wasp shouts as she zips in, beginning to blast him in the face, the rest of the team leaping in to help her, trying to hold the Centurion still. But he proves too strong, throwing them all away as he prepares to fire from his energy staff again. That's when Warbird flies in, hitting him with several energy blasts. You seem awfully fond of an oversized toothpick, the one that you're waving around, so let's see what happens if I absorb the power and clean it off. 
She shouts as she grabs his staff, the energy beginning to leech into her. But Saturian merely smiles. You are magnificent. Your defiance, your determination, your beauty. I have never seen anything like it. He says to her with Carol's eyes widening as she thinks that she recognizes the voice of Marcus, a man who was responsible for terrible things in her life not long ago. But the rest of the team is there slamming into the Centurion, finally knocking him to the ground. And that's when a bright light fills the sky and a booming voice calls out. Cease! Kang shouts, appearing on his floating command chair. My son seems to have overstepped his bounds, Avengers. Forgive him, Kang tells them, looking around at those gathered beneath him. Nevertheless, he did come here on a peaceful mission as my emissary, and he has been treated terribly. This is unacceptable, he says to them, telling the Avengers that the rules of diplomacy means that his son has been treated discourteously. You have no idea the power that you face, Avengers, but you will. You will learn, he says as he smiles, holding up a remote. In space, his ship opens fire on the UN building, destroying it in one powerful blast. The Avengers look in shock as the building is crumbling around them, the team rushing at Kang. You monster, I swear to you, Kang! In the name of the good men and women that you just murdered! Wasp begins to state, but Kang waves her away, telling her to save her outrage. He pushes another button and the rubble begins to glow, bubbles of energy rising out of the destruction with everyone who had been inside completely protected. I have killed no one, he tells them, standing before the Avengers, explaining that he was merely demonstrating his power, and he has come to save Earth. I have seen what is in store for you, Avengers, and the world that you know is doomed. The only hope that you have, the only man who could save you all, stands before you, he tells them. Meanwhile, the rest of the Avengers have found the surviving scientists in Siberia, who informs them that their superheroes have been missing for several hours. Another explosion then rips through the distance and Captain America urges his team forward. Back over at the UN, Kang orders the Avengers to stand down. I did not come to fight. I came to talk. So turn your attention to my Omni screen as I reveal to you your future. The heroes look in shock as the view of the future appears. Tony's armor is destroyed. Spider-Man's mask torn nearby. The city is in ruins around them and strange glowing skeletons are floating through the air. Kang warns them that the creatures will come from the east, that they are the living dead, radioactive soldiers with a poisonous touch. The world will fall quickly and all will be transformed before the creatures, becoming part of their singular mind, forming a great lattice of work that covers the earth. Humanity, at least as we know it, is dead. The images begin to shift on screen and Kang continues. It is possible that this fate can be avoided, if unlikely. But even if humanity survives the threat, will you be prepared for thoughts that lurk beyond the horizon? What have you no defense against? Because you do not even know that it is there. Another image appears of an overly industrialized Earth. The skies choked with smog as powerful corporations hunt down those that challenge them. Another shift in the image and the destruction of the moon has been caused by an environmental disaster, a global winter. The remnants of humanity are fighting a never-ending war. Another shift, an invasion from the planet to Mars, with Earth's remaining heroes fighting against a giant three-legged mech that has been sent to destroy them. Ragnarok, the undead rise driven by the god known as Cthon, a solar flare that burns up the world, a mutant rise-up led by Magneto who enslaved the world, more alien attacks, ancient gods returning from space, monsters, androids, riots, cataclysm. The images begin to shift faster and faster, showing those gathered the numerous ways the Earth will eventually fall. It could be any of these, or a thousand more. And mark my words, men of this century, these are not projections. I am a time traveler. I have seen them all with my own eyes, he says, as he turns to them, telling them that the times ahead will be treacherous, but he can save them, guide them. Guide you from this to a glorious destiny in the stars. But a U.S. military advisor steps forward, telling Kang that they will not listen to him since he attacked them, that his offer of help will be rejected. And he holds up his phone, telling Kang that they have used this to lock onto his ship. Fire, he orders his men, and missiles launch from the earth, clearing the atmosphere, destroying his ship in a large ball of fire. But Kang only smiles, starting back to his screen, showing them as the fire clears, showing that his ship is unharmed. You misunderstand my purpose here, 
This is not an offer of assistance, but a declaration of war. I intend to conquer Earth in order to save it. I will, of course, extend you the opportunity to surrender. He tells them and he smiles as he tells them what will happen next. He tells them that he will take France and Germany first. And as America argues over whether they should aid the foreign countries, Europe will fall within three weeks and the rest of the world shortly after. The heroes of Earth will go through re-education and the rest of humanity's most able-bodied will be conscripted into Kang's army. He will build up the planet's defense, creating an army great enough to defend the planet and send it into space, conquering all of those that they come across. You will never succeed! The world will unite against you! The Secretary General shouts, and Kang looks at him in amusement. Will it, General? He asks, explaining that the world's governments will try to stop him. But he has already begun to spread his message across the planet, that he is offering the rest of the world the ability to become a star-spanning empire. Talk all you wish! The world will fight! The Secretary General shouts, but Kang merely laughs, explaining that his offer has gone out. That the forces from Atlantis have already begun to attack the coast. An army of deviants has already begun to arise. The war is well underway. My armies have yet to fire a shot, and I expect you'll become busy for some time. So I will take my leave now to make my own preparations for the coming invasion of Europe. He says as he looks around, warning the others that if he is fired upon, he will order his ship to fire again. And this time, I will not be protecting those in the blast. And with that, he and the Scarlet Centurion begin to float away, and the military has begun to surround them and order them to stand down. How good that you understand, he says with an evil smile, but before he disappears, he turns it back to the Avengers, reminding them of the dangers that he warned of. Look to the east, Avengers, because it has already begun. He calls out as he goes. Over in Siberia, the Avengers are pushing forward through a strange and twisted landscape. Here! Captain America shouts as he finds a survivor, a Russian hero known as Darkstar. He has returned! Captain America, he has taken them! She gasps at him, and Cap asks, who has returned? But the team is suddenly bathed in a green light as something appears before them, and they all look up in shock as the presence appears, flanked by green glowing skeletons. Yes, it is I, and I bring with me a new dawn, and the blessings of a new kind of life. Blessings I will share with the entire world. The radioactive monsters charge forward, attacking the Avengers. Strike, Avengers! Strike hard and sure! Thor bellows as he fires lightning at these monsters. We must force these unnatural creatures back, lest they overwhelm us and the world! Firestar keeps blasting away, but the monsters quickly overwhelm her. Luckily, Quicksilver is there, pulling her clear of the danger, and he looks to his friends, aware that they are having little effect on the creatures. There must be some anti-radiation foam back at the sentry stations on the borders of this hellish place. Maybe they'll have an effect. He shouts at his comrades as he races away. Meanwhile, over at Prince Edward Island, Canada, a group of Avengers are fighting against the barbarian hordes of Atlantis, who are aided by a massive monster. The others fight against the hordes while Jack of Hearts and Wanda square off against a beast. The monster lashing out, knocking Jack to the ground. Blast it! Where's Hank? We could really use the strength of Goliath right about now. Wanda shouts, and Hank suddenly comes flying in on a floating disc, now dressed as Yellow Jacket. Here I come to save the day! He sings with a big smile, hitting the beast with a bio-disruptor blast, but it has no effect, and the monster smacks him out of the sky. As the battle rages on, the Atlantean usurper known as Aterna watches from a distance, standing next to his mage who controls the monster Torg with a magical orb. Meanwhile, over in China, She-Hulk, Black Widow, Warbird, Silverclaw, and Vision fight against the Deviant armies. Aiding the Chinese army, it doesn't take long before the Deviants are beaten and they flee back to their underground lairs. Back over in Siberia, the team is now armed with anti-radiation foam guns. They seem to be holding off the radiation monsters. Fight carefully! Don't waste the foam! It's the only weapon that we have! Captain America shouts to his team, but the guns suddenly explode, now useless. The green light appearing again. You still live, Avengers? The Presence asks them, floating before them, flanked by Starlight, his wife. When I left, I thought my followers would have disposed of you far sooner than this. He says, and Captain America steps forward. We want to talk, Presence. If you've mutilated these people unwillingly, you've got hostile intentions. He begins, but the Presence merely waves his hand, and a blast of energy rips through the Avengers. Back over in Canada, Triathlon figured out where Ormunda and his major are at. 
He leaps across the water, grabbing a hold of the orb that controls the monster known as Torg. Mind if I borrow this? Thanks! He jokes as he flips away, the monster suddenly becoming docile again. What is this? What is Torg doing? The monster growls and Jack of Hearts flies forward. I'll tell you, what you're doing now is taking a nice refreshing dip. He shouts as he punches the monster across the face, knocking him into the water. The battle quickly ends with the Avengers convening inside of a military tent, trying to figure out their next move. Janet asks why Hank would appear in his yellow jacket costume. I just felt like it, and things worked out, he tells her with a smile. But suddenly he clutches his stomach, moving towards the entrance to the tent. The wars across the Earth continue, with Kang and his son watching from their ship in orbit. The Avengers have changed. They are more suited for a global crisis, Kang notes. Still, they have much to cope with, he says with a wave of his hand, as his screens now show him the various battlefields throughout the world, with Scarlet Centurion questioning his father about his tactics, wondering why they don't just attack with their armies, questioning whether their tactics are honorable. Honorable? Make no mistake, Marcus. Honor is a man's greatest possession, but honor is personal. War is fought through the surrogates. Otherwise, it is merely a duel. Kang teaches him, explaining to his son that if they attack with their armies, then the Earth would unite against them. But to allow them to fight among themselves and weaken themselves is the overall goal. Meanwhile, over in China, the ground begins to quake beneath the team of heroes again. And with it giving out beneath them, it causes them to tumble into a vast cavern. And Carol raises her hand, creating an energy glow that illuminates the armies of the deviants around them. Yes, humans. You are in my domain now, so let us see how well you fare against us this time. Their leader says with a smile. Back over in Canada, Janet is called into the tent by the soldiers, and they found Hank passed out on the ground. Janet grabs him, staring in shock as his hand begins to fade from existence. Back over in Siberia, Firestar begins to awaken, surprised to find nobody nearby. I'm alive? But what I felt, the radiation on that level, it should have been more than enough to, she begins to say to herself, but the smoke begins to clear, revealing Thor nearby. Good, the madman's lightning could not affect me. The others must be around here as well. Thor says his Firestar runs to him, but out of the smoke comes a glowing hand. And the radiation creature that was once Captain America grabs a hold of Thor, lifting him into the air. No, it cannot be, Thor shouts. Aboard his ship, Kang continues to watch, bursting out laughing at his conquest. I must admit, there is such a joy in a campaign so successful. Beneath the earth, Carol steps forward, pointing at the hordes of deviants. Who leads this rabble? I name you a coward, hiding behind weapons and bodyguards. Cower and worse, I name you unfit to lead, she shouts. She-Hulk looks at her in shock. What are you doing? She whispers, and Carol shakes her head and glances at her. Shh, she hisses, pointing her finger, challenging the leader to single combat for the right to lead. I am Depis. A woman cannot challenge for leadership, nor a human. He laughs at her, but she calls him a coward, causing the other deviants to look at him in doubt. And Depis finally nods. Very well. You shall battle my designated champion as my right as leader. And when you fall, you shall become my body slave. Bringing cheers from his army in the deviant's part, revealing a large slug-like creature. Oh great, what is he, nine feet tall? This may not be as easy as I'd hoped for, Carol whispers to herself. Meanwhile, back in Siberia, Thor and Firebird continue to fight, blasting the radiation monsters that were once their friends. Thor grabs the former Black Knight, throwing him into the ground, but Quicksilver is suddenly there, rapidly punching him across the face and staggering the god. Zounds! Quicksilver's strength has been greatly magnified, and his touch burns! Thor says as he wipes the blood from his mouth and begins to whirl his hammer, creating a wind blast that tosses the monsters away. He then turns as Captain America leaps at him, but Thor reaches out, grabbing a hold of his shield. Fight this, Captain! Assert thine indomitable will and break free of this unseemingly thraldom! Firebird turns to him as she continues to blast away. You have to forget Cap, Thor! That's his body, but his mind is still dead! She shouts, but the anger begins to boil up in Thor as he raises his hammer up over his head, lightning cracking through the skies! Blow winds, roll clouds, storms of the earth and sky! Thor, god of thunder, commands thee! He says as he takes his hammer in both hands. This man, this hero, he should not have died like this, and by my hammer he shall be avenged! But back aboard his ship, Kang continues to watch all of the conflicts below. And on it goes, the old dance. With a few words, they rise at each other's throats. 
he says with a smile, and he turns as Scarlet Centurion enters the room, telling him that the first recruits from Earth have arrived to swear allegiance to him. Kang nods as he floats out into the room. Looking around those that have gathered, he points to one, demanding to know why he should be qualified to join Kang's army. The man seems confused, but quickly begins to list off his qualifications. But the man is interrupted as Whirlwind enters the room, casting the others away with gusts of wind. He laughs at Kang, telling him about his power and demanding that he be made general. Well then, I have your first assignment, general. Kang says as he pushes a button on his floating chair, and with a blast of energy, Whirlwind suddenly disappears. Kang already has power, the Conqueror says to those that have gathered around him. What I seek is obedience, ability, and discipline. I will not tolerate anything less, he shouts. But back down on Earth, Carol hits the Deviant known as Gloom with an energy blast, but the blast merely goes through his gooey body. The Deviant laughs, reaching out, grabbing her, pulling her close as she begins to get sucked into his body. Now you will feel the embrace of Gloom, he bellows. And over in Siberia, Thor and Firebird continue forward as Thor's storms are creating a path through the green monsters, finally having them land in front of Presence and Starlight. Strike storm clouds, let these foul beings feel thy wrath, for Thor would speak to the master undisturbed. He bellows into the wind. The Presence doesn't seem overly impressed with him. Ah, Thor, you have great power, pretender to godhood, but I am the Presence, I am power personified. If you cannot be transformed, you will be slain, he says, shooting a blast of energy at the god. But Thor holds up his mighty hammer, blocking the blow and beginning to absorb the energy. I think not, Presence. I am Thor, and thou shalt judge for thyself whether I am pretending, he shouts, stepping forward, beginning to absorb the energy from the Presence's body. Thou hast used thy power badly, and thou shalt use it no more! Thor says, and the presence begins to wither before their eyes. But back down beneath the earth, Carol has been sucked inside a gloom's body. Inside, she sees nothing but darkness, but she can sense something. She reaches her hand out, finding a shard of a crystal within the Deviant that acts as its only organ. The crystal shatters in her hand, and gloom falls to the ground, releasing her from his grasp. Carol quickly catches her breath, struggling to her feet. So your deviantness what's it gonna be? Surrender or a complete betrayal of what passes for your code of honor in front of your men? She finally acts dual plus. But back over in Siberia, Thor continues to absorb the energy, with the presence falling to the ground, but Starlight calls out asking him to stop. Please, don't kill him, I share his power. Perhaps I can drain it from your comrades. Restore them, she says. And Thor agrees, stopping his assault, but he questions why she would save the monster. Just as I share his power, I share his curse. Our lethal power prevents us from associating long with others. Without him, I would be alone. She says as she cradles the presence. Thor looks at them. Perhaps, woman, thou wouldst be better off that way. Time passes, and Thor and Firebird stand by while scientists continue to work on their friends, making sure that they're okay after being returned to normal. And beneath the earth, Carol now sits on her new throne, watching as the Deviants follow her orders and disarm themselves. They all check in with Janet Van Dyne, who puts in a word with the US government, telling them the Avengers are ready to fight back against Kang. Secretary General thanks her, hanging up the line, turning to his co-worker as they both walk out of the room. They'll be here. And I hope that they come up with a way to end Kang's threat swiftly and cleanly, because I don't mind saying, I don't like the backup plan. He says as they walk into the next room, staring up at rows of sentinels being prepared. And this is the beginning of Kang Dynasty, also known as Kang War. This is parts one through four, but this is a 17 or 16 part series, so it's gonna take us a little time to get through it. Make sure you like, subscribe, and you hit that notification bell so you know when the next parts are coming out. Because I can tell you right now, this story is not what's going to be on this big screen when the movie comes out. There's no way they're gonna fit all of this into one. They could fit portions of it, but not all of this. So I'm excited to see what they're going to do. But that also means that you have a story here that won't be in the movies so like subscribe stick around and we will talk to you guys very soon